Thank you. Okay, so so here is the structure of this talk. So before I start, I will give you some conceptual preliminaries and to make sure and, uh, and we are on the same page about some basic concepts and that we I will just go through again and again. And uh, it will be followed by uh, a critical review of the traditional philosophical approaches to analogical reasoning. And uh, I will, there are quite uh, a few, not a, a lot, but quite a few different approaches. And I will classify them into two groups. One, what I call top-down approaches and the other a bottom-up approaches. And I will also just uh, examine a few main problems for these uh, traditional approaches. And then I will just introduce my own approach, the so-called functional approach. The reason I call it the functional approach is because I'm, I mean, this approach is rooted in my previous work. I have just developed a functional approach um, in particular to the development of science, especially in scientific progress. Okay. So then I will use an, a historical example to illustrate my approach and also and to use that historical case to examine uh, the traditional approach and my approach and uh, i will try and then conclude with a comparative analysis and uh, of all these approaches okay so here's just a plan okay so preliminaries and uh, if you take a look so so probably I can start like this. So the philosophical analysis of analogy or analogical reasoning started around in 1960s by a famous female philosopher of science, Mary Hess. Mary Hess actually at that time uh, was a lecturer uh, in history and philosophy of science uh, in HPS department at UCL. And uh, he, uh, he published a famous book called Models uh, and Analogies in the sciences. Uh, in the first edition appeared in 1963 and the second uh, large one in, appeared in 1966. That's actually uh, probably the starting point for most of philosopher science to earn, uh, especially for those who are interested in, in the study of analogical reasoning. Okay, so if you take a look at the philosophical literature on analogical reasoning, they will find these four terms uh, just appear. Again, again, analogy, analogical reasoning, analogical argument, and analogical inference. Uh, you may sometimes feel puzzling because these terms are used from time to time interchangeably. But I have to say, uh, in my talk, uh, I found these terms are different and treat them differently. Okay, so here are some definitions. Actually, not just me. Paul Barthes, uh, another. Uh, philosophers who actually recently published a book in 2010, focusing on analogical reasoning, also observe such a puzzling phenomena. So to begin uh, his book, he made three definitions. And uh, basically I, uh, I just take his definition here. So analogy for Barthes is a comparison between two objects or systems of objects uh, that highlight and uh, the respects in which they are thought to be similar. So just in short, analogy, what I understand analogy actually just a relation and between two objects. And uh, analogical reasoning just means any types of reasoning or any types of thinking that just based on an analogy or based on analogies. So based on some similar relationships. And analogical reasoning refers to an explicit representation of analogical reasoning that cites accepted similarities between system support for conclusion that some further similarity exists. So analogical reasoning is a very rigorous representation. Okay, it's very clear in terms of premises and conclusion. Analogical inference is a little, uh, I mean, comparatively little, uh, uh, mentioned in Barthes' book, but I think it's also very important and also quite crucial in my talk that for me, 
an analogical inference is different from a, an analogical argument in a sense it is basically a hypothesis based on analog reasoning that for short of a full-fledged analogical argument for example someone can have say especially for scientists they can make some analogical inferences without have a very explicit argument they can just say based on the observations we had we can infer some particular phenomena will occur under what and what condition but probably they do not have a very uh, rigor form of argument behind that inference so that's the difference between analogical inference and analogical argument okay so this is all about the basic concepts. And another thing I would like to highlight at, from the very beginning is uh, my talk focused on analogical reasoning in the natural sciences. We know and people and scientists use analogical reasoning widely, uh, not only just in natural sciences, but also in the social sciences and in some humanities, for example, in, uh, like in the law and also in some uh, pure mathematics and even in your everyday life. But these areas are not my focus today. And hopefully, if you like my approach, and also uh, I will be interested in exploring its application in other domains. But today's talk is just within our situated within the context of the natural sciences. Okay, okay let's start with some traditional philosophical approaches. As I just mentioned, so uh, most of philosophical examinations of analogical reasoning just uh, start from Mary Hacks' 1963 book, Models and uh, Analogies. And that quite, and uh, since then, philosophers and uh, from time to time go back to the notion of analogy and analogical reasoning. And uh, I found most of them, if not all, actually can be classified into a group called top-down approaches. Another representative of the top-down approach is Paul Barthes' recent book by Parallel Reasoning. Okay, that was published by Oxford University Press in 2010. So what is a top-down approach? My uh, here is my definition, brief definition. A top-down approach actually is an approach which involves evaluating analogical arguments or reasoning in terms of an abstract form or schema that all analogical reasoning and uh, arguments are supposed to fit. So just give you some sense, concrete sense of what that means. So here is a quite typical schema, both shared by Hess and uh, Barthel. This is a model. So we have source domain, say S and target domain T. We also have P, P star, Q, Q star. Okay, so philosophers analyze analog analogical uh, argument in terms of the, um, by this model. So now we have source domain and uh, target domain. We got P, P star, Q, Q star, and also have horizontal uh, relations and then vertical relations. Okay, so what are they actually? So let's first, first of all, let's just focus on horizontal relations. So for Hess and Barthel, they differ in the interpretations of these uh, letters, let's say P, P star, Q, Q star. For Mary Hess, P, Q, P star, Q star, actually what he, he called it, characters of S and T. You can understand P, P star, Q, and Q star as a property of the domain S and T or objects S and T. For example, uh, you can think about the, uh, uh, the smell of a chemical element that can be regarded, the smell itself can be regarded P. And if say the smell of two chemical elements are similar or analogous, then P, Q, just another physical property of uh, a, a chemical element. So for Mary has P, Q, uh, P, uh, P star, Q star, just the property of the objects or of the different systems. But for Bartha, 
pre-existing pre position actually is a wider ranged. So P, Q, P star, Q star, choose sets of propositions, propositions to choose uh, about as NT. And there also uh, another difference between the, the interpretations of the truth of the say Q star. The Q star actually the, is typically the conclusion of an analogical argument. Typically, people will say, they use this model will say, because we have two systems, S and T. In system, in system S, we've got a property P. In system T, the property P star. If P is similar to P star, and we, we both have Q and Q star. So we might just infer that Q, if there's a Q in S, then we, we can just infer that Q star is also held in system T. So how can we interpret that? Mary has will say the conclusion of a good analogical argument justify selecting such a hypothesis that Q star is true for further empirical investigation. So that's a good starting point for further investigation. But for uh, Barthel, he argues that just means Q star is plausible. So they also have different views uh, on the interpretation of Q star. And there are another three important uh, conceptions about analogy. And that actually originated from the Keynes, the famous economists work. Positive analogy, negative analogy, and a neutral analogy. Positive analogy just means, say, there are some the similarities between two domains, S and T. So, for example, P holds in both S and T. Then we will say, S and T actually are in positive analogy. If we have some property P which holds in S but not in T, or holding T but not in S, we will say there is a negative analogy between S and T. Suppose there's some property P holding S, but we, are, we have no idea whether it holds in T, then we'll say it, they are in neutral analogy. These are the, the three important notions introduced by Mary Hess. Okay, so now let's look at the vertical relations. We, I just uh, introduced so P, P star Q, Q star main. So, but in what way or under what conditions we can make an analogical inference according to Mario Hess or Pobato? How should we interpret or define the vertical relations? For Mario Hess, vertical relations must be causal relations. For example, we have P and Q in system S and P star Q star in system T. Suppose P is P and P star in a positive an uh, analogy. In other words, P is similar to P star, Q is similar to Q star. How can we know Q star is true? For Mary Hess, P and Q must be in a causal relation and the P star must be causally related to Q. So the argument or the logic run like this, we've got P, Q, P star, Q star. P similar to P star, Q similar to Q star. P is causally related to Q and the P star causally related to Q star. Then we can conclude, given that we know P, P star, Q and they are causal relationships, we conclude P, Q star is true in T. This is, uh, has account, but we can see that it, it is definitely the, there are some problems with has account. First of all, has didn't give us a very explicit account of causation, so it's not very clear. So, in what sense P is causally related to Q? On the other hand, causation is one of the most controversial topics in the philosophy. It's, there's no consensus on the concept of definition causation. And even if we pick any of them, we will find that criterion is quite demanding. In order to, and uh, if we require 
there it must be a causal requirement in an analogical reasoning, then we have to say it's really, really difficult for anyone to draw any analogical inference. So Bartha tried to resolve that problem. He also found, first of all, they had the ambiguity problems of uh, the causal relation uh, requirement. Secondly, it's too demanding. So Bartha just say, actually, we don't need causal requirement. That's too strong. All we need is just some prior associations. There are four types of prior associations that Bartha identify, predictive, explanatory, functional, correlative. So Bartha is trying to provide a quite comprehensive uh, account of analogical reasoning. And uh, he named his approach and the theory as articulation model. He tried to articulate the very detail of each of these prior associations. Okay, so this is just a basic idea of Hess and Barthes' accounts. So what's in common? Uh, why I call them top-down approaches? Just because both approaches begin with a kind of abstract form of argument. And uh, basically just characterizing terms of horizontal relations and uh, vertical relations. So, and both try to understand and evaluate particular analogical arguments in terms of the abstract form. So for Hess and Bartha, what is in common is they both believe in order to assess the validity of any analogical reasoning, one should start with some general abstract form, with that form in your mind then we can just use some fairly simple HD model that with that abstract form in mind or abstract schema in mind, then we just apply it to the practices and to see if our practice just and fits these schemas. If it fits, then our then some particular inferences just valid. If not, then they are invalid. So that's why of course it's top down. We got something up uh, on the higher level abstract form, then just apply it in actual practice and to evaluate and analyze mm, analytical reasoning in the sciences. Okay, now let's move on to uh, another popular approach, what I call it, uh, summarize as a bottom up. And the, most famous representative of the bottom approach is developed by John Norton, one of the very famous philosopher science uh, based at Pittsburgh. And he got this wonderful book, The Material Theory of Induction. Actually, he wrote this book for quite a lot, long time, probably five or six years, and uh, keep updating. Before it's published, uh, just uh, he keep posting the uh, chapter, draft chapter the, on his website. And so even before that book got published and uh, you, everybody know that. And, and uh, another interesting thing about him is that he always claimed philosophers should never write books. Philosophers should only write articles, but ironically he ended up always writing a book. Okay, so uh, this book is not, a, I mean, mainly about analogical reasoning. It's a book that focuses about induction or inductive reasoning, but for, Norton, analogical reasoning is just one species of inductive reasoning. So his approach to analogical reasoning is just an application of his approach to induction or inductive reasoning. And his approach, um, he named the material approach. And the basic idea is uh, in order to understand inductive reasoning or analogical reasoning when have to begin with the particular cases. And but in contrast to the top-down level, he'd quite dislike the idea like we should have a general theory or general account of analogical reasoning. He think all analogical inferences are local, are contact sensitive. So we should only pay attention uh, to concrete cases. We should examine 
analysis in case by case. And so this is actually consistent with his material theory of induction. He made two big climbs, also two slogans, if you like, about induction. One is all induction is local. So there's, there's, and there's no universal rules for inductive inferences. For example, I'm not quite sure if you're familiar with the philosophy uh, literature like David Hume famously proposed an idea of a regularity view of induction. So for example, we know a raven is black, second raven black, the third raven black, we found a hundred ravens and uh, then and all uh, these hundred ravens are black. So we might just infer uh, all ravens black. And this is regularity view of induction. And uh, in the past 50 years, and uh, especially quantitative researchers who developed the Bayesian approach to induction, right? Just uh, under the Bayesian conditionalization theorems, then we can just uh, characterize induction in a probabilistic way. But that's not Norton thinks is right about induction. He thinks that it will be in vain if you are looking for a universal rule for induction. Actually, all induction is local. Accordingly, Norton just uh, when talking to uh, about uh, anal analogical reasoning, Norton denies any abstract form which can capture analogical reasoning in the sciences. Even if Barth uh, tries again and again trying to say, we can make some, some minor modifications to our, I mean, uh, ground theory, then by making some ad hoc modification, we can accommodate him more and more uh, anonymous, but that's definitely Norton quite uh, found impossible. And uh, again, Norton favors his material approach. So what he is exactly Norton's uh, material approach to analogical reasoning? There are two important concepts for Norton. One is facts of analogy. Second is analogical inference warranted by facts of analogy. Facts of analogy actually defined as a factual states of affairs that arises when two systems properties are similar with the exact mode of correspondence expressed as part of the fact. So facts of analogy is something you have to uh, identify when you try to assess an analogical inference. And all these facts of analogy are fairly local. You can't find any universal facts of analogy. Okay. And uh, for analogical inference, how can an analogical inference be warranted by facts of analogy? There are two ways. It really depends on the nature of the facts of analogy. For some facts of analogy, which are just uh, uh, held unconditionally, then we simply just try to make a deductive inference. Given the facts of analogy, then we can justify analogical inferences. But if the facts of, uh, of analogy just uh, inductive in nature, for example, probabilistic in nature, we, it's not 100% and uh, unconditionally held. For example, like we know, say, uh, smoking just raised 70% uh, probability of getting lung cancer. Then in this case, we can only justify the analogical inference in an inductive way. I will just give you an example to show you how Norton used this. Okay, Norton's famous uh, favorite example is Galileo's discovered some mountains on the moon. The, a basic idea is Galileo just drew an analogy between the Earth and the Moon by observing the sh changing of the shadows of the Moon. So what is the fact of analogy here? Just the mode of the creation of shadows on Earth and, of a, uh, and uh, on the moving dark patterns on the Moon. It's just the same, right? Then we know uh, on the Earth, on Earth, we know the shadow caused by the mountain. Then, and also that's following the uh, law of the 
sunlight, the motion of the sunlight. So similarly, because the, the, the motion of light, the sunlight actually just the same on the moon and on earth. So we can just infer by anal analogical reasoning that there are some mountains on the moon. And in this case, it's pretty clear not to try to argue, look, Galileo first of all identify the fact of analogy. The fact that analogy is just the, the motion of light, just the same, both on moon and on earth. So use that fact of analogy, we can just justify the inference that there are mountains on the moon. And just know that this fact of analogy, again, confirms Norton's uh, account. That is, it is local because the motion of light, uh, Galileo never says the uh, motion of light is the same, all the same universally. It's just talking about just in the context of the earth and the moon, not about other <laughs> celestial bodies, say other planet, other stars. So, or any other satellites, right? So it's just about these two, it's quite a local fact of analogy. So this in such a way, Norton, how Norton used his uh, material uh, approach to analyzing analogy with it. Okay, so why I call this approach button up, I found probably you can see it's quite obvious because this type of analysis after beginning with the particular examples, particular analogical inference under investigation in order to determine if an analogical inference is valid or not, we must first identify something local in, uh, in Norton's term, facts of analogy. Then we can just investigate its validity but to try to assess it whether any fact, local, local fact, warrant or justify the inference. And uh, it's quite important to highlight a difference. There's no need to, to look for any general level or higher level form or abstract form of an analogical reasoning here. We do not need to look for a ground theory of analogical reasoning in order to assess the validity of analogical reasoning. Okay, the, this is the basic, the basic idea of Norton's approach or the bottom up approach. Now let's just move on to uh, some, uh, take a look at some problems of these traditional approaches. There are quite a lot, but I only just try to name a few main problems I found quite uh, important. There is, first of all, as you can see, quite obviously there is a scope problem. Once you have a any particular general account that tries to uh, cover all analogical inferences in the history of sciences, there's always a difficulty because you can always find a counterexample. Our history of science is so rich. Philosophers, historians, it's so easy for them to point out, look, it's not, no matter what kind of a general theory you can just uh, formalize, they can always find out some kind of example, say it, it's not fit in this case or in that case. So that's a scope problem. Of course, I'm not trying to say the scope problem is a decisive objection. There are ways and uh, to um, by made, but making modifications and to improve any general theory. But this is a problem. This is a persistent problem. There's always someone must come up with new count example say, look, it probably, I mean, even with some modifications, the, your general account still couldn't work in some particular case. So this is a, a problem, but as I just said, it's, it not, it's not a decisive. It seemed to me the scope problem, the scope problem actually is related to another more serious problem. Why there is a scope problem? Just because I think they're actually it's rooted in a, what I call the gap problem. There always, and uh, in many cases, a gap 
between philosophical analysis and scientific practice, especially between how philosophers analyze and how scientists practice. This is not a unique or distinct problem for the philosophical examination of analogical reasoning. It also exists in other topics. For example, in uh, Peter Archimston identified the gap problem in the context of uh, confirmation and evidence. And one of his argument is like, uh, a scientist tends to ignore philosophers analyze analysis of evidence. Even if philosophers try to convince people like say, HD model is hopeless and it's problematic for scientists. And even today are still using the HD model widely in their research and practice. So go back to analogical reasoning. And uh, Norton, uh, I mean, makes, I think, very good remarks on that. When faced with the problems of determining how good an analogical reason uh, inference is, the scientific literature does not seek guidance from a formal theory of analogical reason. It does not ask for rules on how to trade off the competition of positive and negative analogy, the refinement of the analogy regarded as an empirical question to be settled by measurement. So just think about this and just a scenario where scientists are trying to investigate the validity of analytical reasoning. They are not treating that as a logical problem. They are not trying to look for a golden rule, a concrete general theory of an algorithm and just try to test it and see oh, if this case fits that theory. If not, it's not, no. Scientists just take that as an empirical issue, trying to solve this problem by empirical investigations, sometimes by doing experiments, right? But that clearly it's much more difficult or more complicated than a logical issue whether it's deductive or inductive can be uh, obtained by some large uh, general theory. No, it's not the case. So this is, these are two main problems I identified for top-down approach. Re regarding the bottom-up approaches, and uh, there are also quite a few problems. One of the most important ones is identified by Barthel, as you can see, the enemy of Norton, right? And uh, his idea like this. So for Norton, facts of analogy warrant and logical inference, that's fine. But the problem is, how do these facts warrant and logical inferences? So Norton just denied there's a high level theory justify the examples or the inferences of analogy. But it seems like Norton tried to justify this by some facts. But what are the nature of these facts of analogy? Can we say Norton are looking from lower level, not high level, not over there, but down there, some lower level generalizations covering both domains. Then here is a dilemma for Norton. Either he accepts that, say yes, all analogical reason inferences are warranted by lower level generalizations. Then if it is the case, then it seems the lower level generalization collapse with higher level general theory. In this way, the material approach is just a disguised button up approach because they are still looking for something very general. If Norton says no, then there will be a more serious problem, I think, because if Norton says no, there's no such a lower level generalizations. Actually, different and logical inferences are justified by different local facts. That's fine. But a more serious, there will be a conceptual problem here is given all analogical reasoning are so different, facts of analogy are different analogical inferences are different, then why you call them all analogical reasoning? Because they are so different, they are nothing in common. 
So the concept of analytical reasoning just in danger. Okay, and uh, these are some uh, problems and for each of bottom up and uh, top down approaches. Now I have a general problem for both. That is what I call the problem of practice. As we can see, either the schema you can see from the Hess and the Barthes account or uh, Norton's account by using facts of analogy. Both approaches focus on providing an account of how scientists employ analogical reasoning to make inference or to propose hypotheses, models, theories. They focus, they focus on theoretical activities. But we know scientists using an analogy or analytical reasoning to do various things, not just about theorizing, modeling, or explanation. They also using analogy to design experiments, to introduce a concept to a different domain, also, and uh, to improve their practice. There are some non-theoretical aspects in which analogical reasoning is also widely used. Then it, it is a natural question, how Norton, or that's how the top-down or button-up approaches can cope with or handle with these, or try to capture these practices. How can they provide an account to explaining, so what, and what condition scientists use up analogical reasoning to design new experiments. I will go back and to illustrate this problem in my case study in a few minutes. Okay, so before I move to introduce my account on my approach, I think it's a time just to sit back and think about what we really want. As a, what I have, have trying to show that and neither top down nor bottom up approaches are good enough, it seems that we do need a good approach and or what I would call an ideal approach. And uh, what is an ideal approach? And uh, or what an ideal approach aims at or aims to achieve? I think Bart is quite right. There are two, I mean, at least two main goals that an idea approach aims to achieve. One is to provide an insightful and faithful representation of the patterns of analogical reason. That's a descriptive goal. An idea philosophy approach aims to provide a, a good description of the analogical reasoning and how it is used in practice. And the second is a normative goal. It's just to explain how individual analogical arguments justify their conclusions, how we found some normative grounds to justify the validity of analogical reasoning. Therefore, there are two desiderata. The descriptive desiderata and ideal approach should be based on scientific practice. So, and the second, an idea approach should provide a justification or at least some normal grounds to justify analogical reasoning in different contexts. And uh, as we can see from my discussion earlier, top-down approaches have some problems of fulfilling the descriptive desideratum and bottom-up have problems with the normative one. That's actually why I think we should just think, try to develop a new one. My approach actually basically just based on, I mean, rooted in my more general approach uh, to scientific development and uh, practice. That's what I call the exemplar based approach. And the basic idea, I won't go through too much detail, but the basic idea is scientific practice and its development is best characterized in terms of exemplary practices. And exemplary practice is defined as a particular way of problem defining and problem solving. 
typically by means of problem defining, uh, sorry, problem refining, conceptualization, hypothesization, experimentation, and reasoning. And uh, uh, my favorite example is Mendel's work on garden bees. And he not only just proposed new research problems, but he also just designed a complete new set of experiments and, and introduced new concepts like dominance, recessiveness, and to also propose new hypotheses and use these with his particular reasoning to solve the problems of the development of hybrid. So the main lesson I take from this exemplar-based approach is scientific reasoning, as I just introduce it just part of an exemplary practice so scientific reasoning including i mean inductive reasoning deductive reasoning objective reasoning and analogical reasoning is a mutually intertwined with other activities in practice scientific reasoning especially analogical reasoning should not be analyzed independent of its context that's the first and i think that one lesson we, we can learn from the exemplar-based approach. And also you can see this, this I just distanced from myself from the top-down approaches. Because for top-down approaches, they actually try to analyze analogical reasoning in a context-free way, because they, they really don't mind. I mean, from the, as a start point, they don't really mind what context is starting just try to come up with a general theory, a general schema. But for me, it's not the right way. We have to just situate an, a philosophical analysis within its historical context. This is why I propose analogical reasoning should be understood as a tool for scientists to define and resolve problems in practice. More specifically, analogical reasoning is used as a tool to contribute to many activities, including the, how to define problem, how to introduce and use a concept, how to propose hypothesis, model theories, and how to design and conduct experiments. So here is the main idea of a functional approach. When analyzing a particular analogical inference or a particular use of analogical reasoning, we should situate it in its research context, identify its relation to other activities, abstract and schematic form and evaluate in its context. Now, as you can see, my approach actually shares some similarities with Norton's material approach, because my approach also emphasize the significance of a case-by-case -case analysis. So the starting point is, uh, is quite is pretty similar to Norton's material. We have to start with case, uh, concrete cases and uh, look for the patterns behind and evaluate within context. However, there is a crucial difference between functional approach and the material bottom-up approach. Because for Norton, he denies we can just have any universal rules or universal accounts of analogical reasoning. But for me, there is something in common between all these different analogical inferences. What's that? That's what I call the usefulness criteria. That's also related how analogical reasoning can be justified or evaluated. For Norton, the only way to evaluate analytical inferences is just to identify facts or local facts of analogy. Once we identify that, then we can just, just justify. But I'm not looking for any facts of analogy. What I'm looking for is I think the evaluation should be just done in a functional way in the sense how an analogical reasoning works in practice. 
more precisely speaking, a particular use of analytical reasoning or a particular analytical inference, it's valid if it contributes to a useful exemplary practice. So my definition of usefulness is like this. An exemplary practice useful if and only if it's a particular way of problem defining and problem solving is repeatable and it provides a reliable framework for further investigation to solve unsolved problems and generate novel problems across different fields. There are four features of virtues, if you like, that consist in the notion of you. Usefulness, defining novelty and interdisciplinarity. So first of all, some practice is useful, means it is repeatable. If something is not repeatable, definitely it's not useful. Second, it should have some problem solving promise. I have to highlight here, problem solving promise is different from problem solving success. Thomas Kuhn is very famous proposed idea uh, that science is basically a problem solving enterprise. And if science is good or not, it really depends if it resolves problems or not. Kuhn highlights the significance of problem solving success, but it, what I'm highlight here is problem solving promise, because if you put too much attention on problem solving success, then it will be really difficult to say, explain the shift from Newtonian mechanics to Einsteinian relativity theory. Because in the 1920s, say, or 1910s, the problem solving machinery or provided by Einstein general theory of relativity clearly was not as good as Newtonian mechanics, but Newtonian mechanics already developed for 200 years. So at that time, Einstein theory only had problem solving promise because if you took the, adopt Einstein framework, then we can, then you will got a promise in the future. It, it will help you to resolve more problems than Newtonian mechanics. But at a time, this promise is not fulfilled yet. And also I highlight and emphasize the significance of problem defining novelty. So if a, an example of practice can generate new research, new uh, lines of inquiry, new novel problems are really important. If they can just propose more novel problems, definitely it, that framework is more useful than others. And another very important thing and uh, feature as uh, I just discussed with Matt and Margarita before my talk is interdisciplinarity, just like the seminar today. A practice is inter interdisciplinary, is really important for it to be useful. Science benefits from interdisciplinary input. It's really, really useful and to limit the scope or limit the boundary of scientific inquiry. So interdisciplinarity is also a very important feature of usefulness. Okay, so, so far, so many abstract talks. So I would like to draw you, so give you a concrete case and just to apply all these philosophical framework and to help you to understand all these quite obscure discussion. Okay, so let's think about, uh, take a look at a famous episode in the history of chemistry. That's quite, uh, I found it's interesting and not very uh, difficult to understand. That's about Humphrey Davy. As you know, Humphrey Davy is one of the most famous uh, chemists and uh, in late 18th century and early 19th century. And uh, the, the experiment or the work I focus on is about his work about chemical decomposition. So at the turn of the 19th century, and some a particular scientific instrument called a voltaic pile, it just, as you can see uh, from my slides. So 
this experiment setup actually consists of a electricity vial a b and uh, you've got two cups metal cups or metal cones and uh, you will put some liquid in these metal cups or metal cones okay actually they are not cones, but you just and yeah but ideally i mean in the past they, they should be cones rather than these like a uh, tube like uh, cups okay so you put literally uh, liquid in these containers if you apply the electricity via the a and b and uh, chemists will find some interesting phenomena by the end of the 18th century, scientists already discovered if you apply the elect electricity to water, then you will get hydrogen and oxygen out. One from the negative elect electricified cup and one from the negatively electricified cup. So you will find that water, apply, to elect apply electricity to water, then you get hydrogen and oxygen. But the scientists at that time cannot conclude or demonstrate that water is decomposable. Why? It's because there are some puzzling phenomena. When you applied that electricity and to water, you will find not only hydrogen and oxygen, you also found some different kinds of acids and alkaline substances appear in the water. So you call some extra substances come out of the water. Then there are some concerns. So where are these extra substances come from? Scientists are trying to identify three possible sources. First, just the cup, because cups are made of metals. So probably just uh, when you apply electricity to water and uh, some material in, I mean, in the, in the metal just released. So that's one possibility. Either probably the water is not pure. There's some impurity in the water. So when you apply electricity in water, then these impurities just came out. Or just because there's some air around that experimental setup. When you apply the electricity, so something in the air just came out. But nobody for sure where these things from. That's, and to just prevent a chemist to make a conclusion that water can be decomposed into oxygen and hydrogen. Then David took up this experiment and he made some significant and important rev a revision of the experimental procedure. He just used like, he tried to control all these confounders in our contemporary terms. He, first of all, he used the, he used the golden cups, pure golden cups. You know, golden uh, gold is element supposed to be undecomposable. So just to try to eliminate the possibility like some impurity material from the metal. So he used golden cups. Then he carefully used uh, distilled water. So make sure water is pure and also use an air pump and, uh, and just replace the air with hydrogen. So in this case, air shouldn't be some intervening factors here. And uh, the result is quite encouraging. No acid or alkaline matter just come out of again. Then Davy just made a very important conclusion that if water is decomposable by the volatile pile into hydrogen and oxygen. That conclusion is, uh, was a milestone in the history of chemistry because, I mean, for thousands of years, people believe water is an element rather than a compound. Think about Aristotle's theory. As for Aristotle, you think the, the world or the universe is consists uh, or composed of five elements, water, fire, air, earth, and ether. Water always taken by people and for thousands of years as an element, but David just showed what is not, what actually is a chemical compound rather than a basic chemical element. 
what is really important about Davis experiment is in, in the following is by using this experimental setup, David made some more discoveries about interesting chemical phenomena. Then he was quite happy with this experiment. So he just tried something differently. So he tried, for example, he put a glass into these containers. Then he found, wow, some soda just appears in, in the negatively electrified cup. And also found some acid from the positively electrified cup. So the conclusion is very clear. Glass can be decomposed into some acid and some soda. Next step is very crucial and important. Afterwards, Davy just try some earthy compounds. That is earthy compounds. I mean, just something like uh, uh, sulfate of lime, sulfate of uh, stontitis. So the reason for David tried these earthy compounds because he found, he thought glass and earthy compounds are quite analogous because they're solid and analogous in various uh, physical properties. So we'll see if glass can be decomposed, what about other earthy compounds? These results are also quite fascinating. If you just put these earthy compounds, then you will find some acid in the positively electrified cup and just uh, some solutions of soda or uh, alkaline in the negatively electrified cup. So David showed and demonstrated earthy compound can be decomposed into some acid and alkaline material. And he also tried to decomposing potential soda. And initially it was not very successful and uh, he struggling to do that. But again, as you can see, David was one of the greatest experimental in history. He was so good at, I mean, doing experiments. So he made some uh, modifications. So put, think, uh, to, let's put story for short. Again, he got what he wanted and he showed that soda and potash can be decomposed with his experiment set up. Okay, so here is the, just the base, um, I mean, uh, um, a short story about what David did in his experiment. Then we can see a natural reason and play some important roles in David's work. First of all, it helps David to inform more and more hypotheses. Just starting from water is decomposable to glass is decomposable and to earthy compound decompose. And how can David just make these hypotheses or inferences mainly based on analogy? And on the other hand, all his experimental sets up actually are designed by analogy. He used a pretty similar experimental sets up, except sometimes he changed the material of these cups. But basically it's the same experiment set. Oh, interestingly, David himself, not only just in, use analogy reasoning in his practice, he also made some reflections about the nature of analogy reasoning. In his book, uh, the, uh, in his 1812 book, that's uh, actually assumed to be a textbook of chemistry at a time. In introduction, he made it very clear. Analogy is an important method for chemists, for them to learn more and more facts and knowledge in science. It should be noted that David himself was a theory skeptic. So David himself uh, was not quite hesitant to propose any general theory. He just liked the idea. He didn't think what he did is eventually will, will just generate a ground theory of chemistry. No, actually what he trying to do is to, to discover more and more facts in his terms in chemistry. Okay, so now let's just take a close look at Davis' analogical reasoning. 
S1 to stand for substance one, say water, S2, glass, S3, other earthy compounds. E1 represents experiment about water and uh, E2 experiment about uh, glass, E3 experiments about earthy compounds, R1 to result of the experiment of E1 and respect R2 is of E2 and R3 results of R3, uh, sorry, E3. And H1 is a hypothesis is that water is decomposable by the volatile pile. And H2 is hypothesis two, namely uh, glass is decomposable by electricity and uh, into acid and um, salt. And H3 similarly just uh, hypothesis concerning decomposability of earthy compounds. To start with, for Davy, all he know is the experiment setup E1 is similar to E2. And he can also observe the results of R1, uh, uh, results of E1 is actually are similar to results of E2. And then he might, and a natural inference for hypothesis two. So we, he can draw a quite a similar hypothesis to the hypothesis one that what is decomposable. So just because the results and experiments are similar, so he just proposed glass is decomposable by electricity. And for his second series experiments, the starting point is an analogy between the substances at this time is not about experiment, but about substance, because earthy compounds are analogous to glass. These two substances are, uh, are similar. So he set up the similar experiments. Then he demonstrated that results are similar. So he reasoned that the hypothesis earthy compound can be decomposable by electricity again. So you can see analogical reasoning play different roles in Davis' work at different levels, not just at a, just at a level of theorizing, actually at a different levels. So here's the logic, just because glass is analogous to earthy compound. So it's rational to conjecture that Glass is, is, de is a decomposable, actually, and is similar to the hypothesis that earthy compound can be decomposable by electricity. And given that uh, a similar hypothesis, similar uh, results of experiments, and given that hypothesis is confirmed by results, so it is rational to inform that earthy compound can be de decomposed by electricity, is confirmed by the results experiment in which all the experiment sets up are analogous to each other. Okay, so this is just basically the Davis case. Let's try to apply the top-down approach to Davis case. Can we okay. use Can I Davis- Can just a second? Sorry to interrupt you. Um, there's about 20 minutes left or so of the seminar. So um, if you wanna have, so, It'd be good to have some time for questioning, um, perhaps. I don't know, do you want to wrap up in the next five, 10 minutes? Is that okay? Or... Yeah, sure, yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah, I, I will speed up. <laughs> so, so yeah, and uh, so for the school problem, again, I can, uh, we, we can see there's school problem for top-down approach when we apply it to the Davis case. First of all, there's no, actually the cause requirement is not satisfied in this case. Because for example, we can just reconstruct that this table here. For the glass, we can see glass is analogous to earth compound because of they are both solid. So solidness is a property of glass and shared by glass and earthy compound. On the other hand, we can also as you will see, this is what we try to demonstrate that it decomposability of glass and decomposability of earthy compound. But the problem is the vertical relation we can see here, the solidness is not causally connected to 
decomposability. So has the approach is not working here. If we just apply has a, a, a approach, then David can never make that inference that earthy compounds are decomposable because there's no causal uh, uh, relation between solidness and the decomposability. And uh, very few and uh, prior association requirement fulfilled here. And uh, we cannot see how solidness just predicts decomposability or explains decomposability, right? And also difficult to see how it is correlated to decomposability. So I won't go to detail. So uh, the basic idea is there is a problem, a scope problem for top-down approach to characterizing or analyzing Davis curves. And also the app problems, as we can see, we never use any abstract schema. As I just mentioned, himself is a serious skeptic. He didn't believe anything general, I mean, theoretically speaking. So he did, when he tried to assess and say, uh, if uh, he can make an, an analogous inference that earthy compounds are decomposed by electricity. He never just say, oh, let's take a look at uh, the, the abstract schema. If it, we can draw some deductive uh, inference from there. No, he tried to demonstrate and uh, justify his analogical reasoning and uh, inferences by experiments. Again, there is a problem of practice. It is not quite sure, even if, I mean, Barthel can, by making some minor modifications and to prove his uh, articulation model and to accommodate the Davis reasoning and at a theoret theoretical level, but it's really difficult to see how the articulation model can be applied just to explain how Davis used analogy to design and interpret experiments. Similarly, for the bot uh, bottom-up approach, there's a problem of practice and uh, we, we have, first of all, again, that's a problem about the facts of analogy. It, from a contemporary point of view, we can say our current chemical knowledge tells us there's something in between, there's some facts of analogy there, but it's, it was not very cl so clear for Davy. And Davy's justification did not rely on these facts, these local facts. Because David had no knowledge of that at all. Secondly, it's still unclear for, uh, for us to see how facts or analogy can help, uh, can help David to design his experiments. Okay, so positive argument is David's work on water, glass, and earthy compounds, and et cetera, can be well characterized as a series of exemplary practices providing reliable framework for his successors like Berzelius and Faraday. And uh, below is a French quote and the basic idea is that Davis' work is just, uh, just open a new door for chemistry and uh, just play a, an exemplary role. So, and uh, more specifically speaking, we can see so what Davis' experiment is repeatable. That's why it was so influential because before Davy and people are not concerned if water can be decomposing to water and the salt, there can be a hydrogen and oxygen. It was Davy who did that experiment and he convinced people just because his experiment was repeated by his contemporaries. And second, Davy's uh, work actually had a great problem solving promise. It explained the anomaly why there are some extra uh, uh, substances came out of the experiment and also to, to implied as a machinery to resolve more problems of chemical decomposition and also indicate a novel life inquiry and a new research problems and introduce electrolysis into chemistry. In other words, Davis work is interdisciplinary. So some short summary for the functional approach and uh, actually shares the similarity with bottom up approach by case by case analysis. So both focus on case by case, but actually differs itself from bottom up by arguing there are some generalized normative accounts 
just like top-down approach. But the difference is for top-down approach, and uh, it emphasizes there are some general abstract form that all analogical inference that can be fit in. But for functional approach, actually it doesn't buy that account. And uh, the one crucial difference between the functional account from traditional approaches actually are actually it emphasize the role of analogical reasoning in non-theoretical activity, which is not covered by top-down or bottom approaches. So two methods, just, just three claims. First, analogical reasoning should be analyzed and examined in its historical context. Second, analogical reasoning should be understood as true for scientists to define and resolve problems in practice and any particular analogical inference is valid if it contributes to a useful exemplary practice. Thank you again for your attention and sorry, I just, it seemed to me run off the time. <laughs>